Okay, so we're happy to have uh, Connor Behan here today. Uh, Connor was a, a master student with me a while ago, so he's he's like my personal contribution to the Bootstrap program. Uh, but I, I guess I was I was interested in that at the time and suggested that Connor start looking into it, and then he went on to do a PhD with Leonardo Rastelli at Stony Brook, uh, then on to Oxford uh, for a postdoc, and uh, was going to perimeter and um, and Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo in a combined deal uh, after this. Uh, so yeah, he's going to tell us about a couple of minimal models and or, well, he's going to revisit that for us today. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be back at the place where I first learned what a component field tree was. Um, and uh, some time later, I learned that a way to get a sense of what conformal field trees might be out there is to take something that is well understood at the UV and then add a relevant operator, ideally a weakly relevant operator, which triggers an RG flow such that it can be fine tuned to end in another CFT, which might be uh, less trivial. Uh, so, in, in the first example of this that we do, the starting point is the theory of a single rescaler. In which case, there's an obvious choice for which relevant operator should be added. This is part of the fourth. Um, this gets you to the icing model. But in recent years, people like um, Osborne and Sturgeon have shown the situation becomes much richer if you consider not just the free scalar CFD in the UV, but a uh, tensor product of this theory. So, and the free scalars. Because then there are many possible quartic interactions you can add. One of them is going to preserve the original symmetry of n free scalars, which is O of n. But for most of the choices of this, uh, you would break symmetry in the IR to be a proper subgroup, which could be either continuous or discrete. And wouldn't most of these have no inferior fixed points at all? So yeah, there are definitely consistency conditions on this. You, you, you can't just cubic canvas algebra model actually just going to do two coupling constants already doesn't have any very fixed point on there is no perturbative regime. Um okay, I, I'm gonna talk about cubic anisotropy in three dimensions. But yeah, th this this coupling constant will need to be built out of invariant tensors of the symmetry that gets preserved by the CFD and the IR. So you, you definitely can't just choose something arbitrary here. But it must be the only very special ones that actually have non-trivial algorithms. Yeah, I, I guess you can call them very special, but they, they certainly produce large tables of new fixed points found this way. Yeah, so you could see why it's relevant. Okay, yeah, this is the epsilon expansion I'm talking about. So this would be four minus epsilon dimensions. So it's irrelevant. So relevant for four minus four minus. Yeah, it, it's marginally irrelevant in 4D to make it weakly relevant. So um, especially today, we can take the next step and not just start with um, a tensor product of free scalar theories. We just need to do the epsilon expansion. We need to start with CFTs that we understand well. And there are interacting CFTs that we understand well. This is a growing list. Um, we understand them either numerically or analytically. So I want to talk about two famous examples of arching flows that come from coupled interacting CFTs. So So one is the coupled icing model in D dimensions. So formally you would write the action for this as a sum of actions for the individual icing models. And then you can add this energy energy operator.
So if n is equal to two, this flows to the O2 model. And if n is greater than two, then this flows to the hypercubic fixed point. So it's called cubic because the symmetry is the cubic group. Um, okay, so for n equals three, this is cubic for n for general n, it's hypercubic. So to the end, so we do a product SN. And another thing you can do is work in a fixed dimension. So you can set d equals two, but then study Q state plots models coupled in the same way. And yeah, it looks exactly the same. The setup. And these models have been studied for decades, but there are some famous problems about them that are very hard to solve with perturbation theory, because in the most interesting cases, epsilon is not small. So in the case of coupled icing, you have, you can write this diagram, D running from two to four. And in two dimensions, this operator has dimension two, so it's classically marginal and you don't have energy flow. Uh, in three dimensions, it becomes relevant, but it's quite strong. And then in four dimensions, it's it is classically marginal again. So you have you have this flow, which everyone is interested in, and this was an open problem for many years because people didn't know whether the O three universality class was more or less stable than the cubic universality class. Um, so in other words, they didn't know if, if it would be realistic to find Heisenberg ferromagnets in nature. And this could not be answered with the epsilon expansion, because you don't just need the UV CFT to be well understood in the epsilon expansion, you also need epsilon to be small. So it actually took a large scale numerical study to answer this question, to find out that indeed, O3, the O3 model has a relevant operator, dimension 2.99 something, which drives it to the cubic fixed point in nature. So this was a numerical bootstrap study by Ch okay, I won't forget. Chester, Landry, Lou, Poland, Simmons, Duffin, Sue, and uh, So th this question took about 50 years to be answered. Now, in the case of the Q-state plots model, this has been studied by But Senko, Jacobson, Lewis, and Pico. In nineteen ninety eight. But there's a very important question about it. Is this a rational CFT or an irrational CFT? So a rational CFT has finitely many primary operators with respect to some cardinal symmetry, and an irrational CFT has an infinite number. And there's something called Boffel's theorem, which says that in this partition function, um, if, if you want to be able to write this as a bilinear combination, of characters, which is a finite sum, then it must be the case that the central charge and all conformal weights are rational numbers. But determining whether a number is rational or irrational is not something you can do with perturbation theory. It's not something you can do with numerics. You would only be able to do it if you could solve the model exactly. So these authors tried to solve this model exactly and they weren't able to. So it's still an open question whether this is rational or irrational. And it's an open question what the chiral symmetry of this model is in the infrared. 
And in fact, the uh, the RG flow diagram looks very similar to this one. So this could even be D or Q. It's <clears throat> so you're in a situation where the three state plus model is interesting and three dimensional coupled icing models are interesting. And this flow is hard. So if you want a weakly coupled flow that um, allows you to trust the epsilon expansion, you have to be close to one side or the other. But here you're starting from a CFT in a fractional number of dimensions or with a fractional SQ symmetry, um, which is formal things to consider. It's non unitary. What we would really like to be able to do is have unitarity and weak coupling, but this model doesn't allow us to do it. So the motivation for the other flows I'm going to talk about soon, the, the couple of minimal models we visited, um, is going to be getting around this problem and having a setup which is um, which is unitary and weakly coupled at the same time. Um, so this is taking a bootstrap point of view. Um, if we don't want to commit ourselves to studying a particular model, we should look for a better starting place for studying the class of models that are like this. Um, another motivation comes from looking at gaps in our knowledge of CFTs, because in two dimensions, the vast majority of CFTs that have been studied before are of this form, irrational. And you might say, of course, they would be rational. Um, if you want to be able to solve a conformal field theory exactly uh, in the spirit of BPZ um, or BPZ, um, then that you should have a finite number of primary operators. But exact solutions are not the only thing we can use, and we don't need to use numerics either. So in higher dimensions, um, there's an analytic approach called the, the light cone bootstrap, which has had much success. And the way that works is you can consider you can consider a four-point function of scalars in the so-called light cone limit, which is which is this. And in this case, um, the four point function, the conformal block expansion really becomes an expansion and twist. So the leading term is going to be from the identity operator. And then there's another term given by Z to the power of the minimal twist over two times some Z bar then, which is exactly known, um, plus higher powers of Z. And in the CFT in three or more dimensions, we can easily pinpoint what this minimal twist operator is. It's going to come from either the distress tensor or a conserved current or, uh, or a so-called light scalar. But in two dimensions, there's a problem because the identity operator has zero twist, of course. It spans equal to the scaling dimension, they're both zero. Uh, the stress tensor has a spin and a scaling dimension of two. So that also has a twist of zero. Uh, besides the stress tensor, you can have these, um, these states created by another combination of Virasoro generators with this positive primary. This is a spin four current, which is in the Virasoro identity multiplet, and it also has a twist of zero. And this goes on forever. You have infinitely many operators with degenerate twist. So you need to do something more refined in order to apply this light cone bootstrap technique of making a four point function some uh, controlled expansion. Uh, but this kind of technique was found um, in recent years. So um, papers that came out the same year, one by Suki and one by Collier, Kowal, Maxfield, and Brunwander. Which reformulated this technique in terms of the Virasoro crossing current or fusion current, which is a very messy expression, but it can be found exactly. And it was found exactly in the 90s by Ponsat and Teschner. So if, if you phrase this at the level of Virasoro blocks, you can take um, you can take not just the quasi-primary identity, this one, but the full Virasoro identity block. And then 
think of what that maps to in the cross channel. So apply cross symmetry to that. And then you can get some results analogous to the first results that were obtained by Gomer Gonski, Chipoyedov, Polins, and stuff, and Kaplan and Patrick's using this in higher dimensions, um, which discovered that so called double twist operators. So, um, Yeah, so, so they discovered that in, in a CFP in dimension above two, there's a universal sector at large spin where the scaling dimension is asymptote to a formula like this, which is what you would expect in just a free theory or a generalized free theory where this operator has the form of L uncontracted derivatives and N uh, contracted derivatives. So there's a, there's a certain large spin universality for CFTs in dimension above two. And by using the Beer's Rural Crossing kernel, um, it's now the case that we know there is a large spin universality also for CFTs in dimension equal to two. But a point these people make is that it needs to be the case that the Beer's Rural identity multiplet is the source of all higher spin currents. So the source of all possible operators that have a twist of zero. If you have enhanced chiral symmetry, then this technique is not enough. You would also need some other fusion kernel, which is not known yet, or some W algebra or some super VSL algebra. And that's where it becomes a problem that so much of the attention in the past has been devoted to these rational CFTs, where indeed you do have enhanced chiral symmetry. So where you would really like to um, study what you can learn from, from the VSL analytic bootstrap, is if you have a CFT with these properties. So a CFT, which is compact, that means it has a discrete spectrum. Unitary. Irrational. And Girasoro as the only chiral symmetry. So some of the few, there are, there are a few irrational, yeah, a few irrational CFTs in two dimensions, which receive a lot of attention. So one of these is the free boson at a generic, um, at a generic target space radius, but we know how to solve free theories. So maybe I should also write interacting And that also has extended chiral symmetry as a U1 symmetry, uh, F on U1. Uh, the nonlinear sigma models for Calabial manifolds uh, at generic moduli are also irrational, but they also have chiral symmetry. You need to have at least n equals two super symmetry for those Calabials. So, there is um, a major dearth of CFTs in the literature which have, uh, which are compact and irrational and have only zero sort of symmetry. It's actually fairly common, or it was common to see the statement that we don't know any examples of CFTs like this. Um, some people say we don't know an example of a CFT that was like a 3D icing model for two dimensions. That would be kind of a joke because the 2D icing model is rational. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is um, a way of coupling minimal models together in order to reach a fixed point, which most likely satisfies all of these conditions. I won't be able to prove it, but I'll show enough evidence that I think the burden of proof um, should be on people to say that it is uh, not one of these types. So in contrast to this picture, um, the reason this is going to work is that minimal models, so the simplest, um, the simplest conformal field theories in two dimensions, the ones that have a central charge less than one, um,
they sort of live in a space which looks like this. So if you map out the central charges between one half and one, um, minimal models are often denoted in this way. So you have M equals three, which is the 2D IC model. Then you have M equals four, which is the tricritical IC model. Then you have M equals five. And if you take a, a non-diagonal modular invariant, people call this the three-state Ponce model, but I'm only going to consider the diagonal modular invariant. So all of the theoretical primaries I consider will be scalars. Uh, and if you take a diagonal modular invariant, then any just five means, I think just called the tetracritical IC model. And then you continue and they accumulate at a central charge of one. So you have infinitely many minimal models in this name. And we can set things up so that at a large value of M, we can find operators which are weakly relevant and become marginal as M goes to infinity or as the central charge goes to one. And if we can find that, then even though these flows are strongly coupled, we'll be able to consider flows that are arbitrarily weakly coupled. And they will all be unitary because M equals infinity on the right-hand side is where the infinite number of unitary minimal models that you can play. So that is a much more favorable situation than this one, um, which we had for a couple of IC models and a couple of possibilities. So are there any questions before I write down the actual model that's going to realize this scenario? Okay. So, In these minimal models, I guess it's, it's probably the last thing, but the, are you taking a lot of them, the same thing, and coupling them? Or? Uh, very good. So it, it's going to turn out that we take at least four of them. Um, yeah, the number that we couple doesn't have to be large. Um, and in fact, th there might be some. Yeah, it might be a bit formal to talk about it at large end. I'm not sure if it stays rational. I, I really will. Yeah, I, I should really say that, that they only give you a fixed point, which is irrational if you have finite end. So that, that's a bit different from what people have done in the past. So in a single minimal model, the central charge has this formula. And the informal weights of primaries are given by the Katz formula, which can be found in the yellow book. So there are two Katz indices, R and R prime. They run from, one of them goes from one to M, the other goes from one to M plus one. And they have a simple formula. And for us, it's important what the expansion looks like at large n. Now, in order to find a deformation like this one, which is relevant, um, we need a holomorphic weight to be between zero and one, so that the scaling dimension sum of two is between zero and two. And at large M, that means we need we need this to be one. What what was the point of you creating this new the the one in the top? Because it was weakly put coupled Unitary? Yes. So uh, every time you start from a unitary CFT yeah. in, in the UV, I, I'm assuming that the CFT you're going to end up with in the IR is unitary as well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even that breaks down if the flow is strongly coupled. But 
I would like to start from unitary theories and then trigger a weekly couple that you flow away from them. And the problem with the other one, the middle one, was that it was not visible. Uh, right. So in in three dimensions, that's a unitary CFT, but this is not weakly coupled. These, um, yeah, I think I wrote down what this what dimension this uh, operator has. Even. Yeah. So this has dimension eight fifths in three D, or in DQ equals three, the three state pots model. Which is not close to two. So that, that's why this is a line of finite length. And if you want this to be very close to two, you would not, uh, you couldn't consider the three state plots model anymore. You'd have to consider like the 2.01 state plots model or the 3.99 state plots model. And as soon as you have, as soon as you analytically continue parameters like that to be fractional, that's where you lose the material. So you have these flows which are tractable, but they're not. So to have a relevant operator that's taken from a minimal model, we need to either consider R, R plus one, or we need to consider um, the, the opposite. We need, yeah, R prime should be bigger by one or R should be bigger than one. And because we want an operator to be weakly relevant instead of irrelevant, we should choose the first one. So, So we should choose R, R plus one, which is still an infinite family of operators, but there will be a finite subsector which closes under fusion because another thing you can look up in the yellow book is that there's um, the so-called Verlinda subalgebra of the fusion algebra, where you take one, uh, yeah, you take the first Katz index to be one, and then you fuse it with another field where the first Katz index is also one. And then that'll just give you operators of this form. So in order to have dimension less than one, we should consider, we should, Take R to be one, and then R plus one is two. And we have this field, which will have dimension uh, one quarter um, minus a little bit. If we did, yeah, if we did one, if we had two comma one instead of one comma two, then of course the dimension would be one quarter plus a little bit. But we want to be able to combine, combine four of them in order to make an operator which is weakly relevant instead of weakly irrelevant. So we're going to take one comma two. And then, Another operator, which we'll be forced to consider by the consistency of the RG flow, is one comma three, where a single copy of this is weakly relevant. It'll have dimension one minus it. And then there are still all sorts of ways we can make a four dick interaction for copies of one comma two, but we're going to choose the simplest one to start, which is the one that preserves the SN symmetry uh, if you have N minimal models in the UV. So that allows you to write down a formal action. Um, so the analog of this, in our case, is going to be the sum of individual minimal models. Plus one interaction, which in the if we want this operator which forming by to be unit normalized, then there's an n choose four here. And then also this operator that we're adding for consistency. And if we want that to be unit normalized, this has one over root n. And it looks like this. 
And as the notation might suggest for future reference, I'm going to call this deforming operator sigma, and I'm going to call this deforming operator epsilon. And this is now um, a weakly coupled RG float if we take M to be large, and we can study its properties. So is there, are there any questions before I start writing down some facts about these models? Yeah, this is sort of the, the statement that every um, that everything that's not forbidden is mandatory in uh, quantum field theory. So if you, yeah, if, if you don't include enough vertices in your Lagrangian, you can um, you can end up with a divergence where there's no counter term left to cancel that divergence. So it, it's exactly the same way you, you generate um, you, you generate interactions like effective field theory. Uh, and, and in fact, yeah, maybe, maybe I should review just um, the reason why we can use conformal perturbation theory on this, even though um, strictly speaking, these are all the theories. So Yeah, this is reviewed quite well in uh, 2016 paper. So if you, if you deform some starting theory by some weakly relevant operator say, you can consider the two point function of this operator. And at, at zero coupling, um, this is a completely finite thing. You can just normalize it to be one. And what we would also like is for, um, is for the, the, uh, the finite coupling version, the, the interacting two point function to also be finite. So this, this object, which can be written with an exponential. So if you tailor expand this guy, the first term is going to be just the UV um, zero coupling two point function we started with. And then the second term will be an integrated three-point function. And this is, what is this? It's, it's G times a self OPE coefficient. C O O O times an integral of the kinematic part of this three point function, which is going to be essentially x to the power of delta O. And if you remember that delta O was close to D because this was weakly relevant, um, you get an integral that blows up. And in order to not have the actual correlation function blow up, we have to say that this G is really a bare coupling constant. And we have a renormalized coupling constant so that the divergent contribution of that cancels this divergence. So it's very much analogous to how you use Green's functions to set up the Cal and Semantic equation in the great perturbation theory of finite diagrams. It's just that you can also have the Green's functions instead expressed in terms of abstract CFT data, like the three point function coefficients and the scaling dimensions, which we know exactly in minimal models. So this is conformal perturbation theory, it's the setup I'm going to be using. And there are some universal results that you can that you can find in this way at one loop. Um, so I, I'm just going to write down one for the beta function. So if we have multiple couplings, because we have two operators there, let's call this GI with an upper index, OI with a lower index. 
then the if beta function is going to be this. Where the only part where you don't use the summation convention is in defining this key tilde. You define it as one minus uh, scaling dimension of the operator i times the i. And there's also a famous result in Sigma logic mode, which is right that does as well, um, which is the shift in the central charge, so the uv central charge minus the ir central charge, which um, Always has the same sign by the C theorem, which you proved. Where Nij is the Zemologikov metric, which is just how you're normalizing these operators in the form. And it, it implicitly appears in the beta function because it's what you have to use to raise and lower the indices on this three by function. So in order to apply these results, we need to use some uh, OPE coefficients in these minimal models. Uh, and we only need to know what they are at meeting order in the large M expansion, even though they are known for any finite value of M as well. So it will be possible in principle to go to two loops or higher. So this one, root three over two up to one of our m corrections. And this one is four over root three. And by using some combinatorics to get OPE coefficients in coupled minimal models from OPE coefficients in individual minimal models and plugging them into this result from control perturbation theory, you get the two beta functions that we need. So there's this classical term and then the one loop quantum term. So if the condition on the L is zero, so you want the capping so such that the quantum corrections are small compared to the regular numbers. Because in some sense, you can truncate that, right? So the first correction. Or there are no yes. Um so if you just look at the first term, um you find that the coupling constants go as one over m, which makes sense because the deviation of these operators from Marginality is order one over m. Yeah. So if you plug one over m into the second term um, and demand is expressed, then then you just need n to be finite, or in fact, if n is large, this is still suppressed. So I, I think we're fine as long as n is large. Okay, so you don't you, you're saying that you don't need n to be large, just enough to have n large. It's just enough to have m large. Um, actually, this, yeah, this is finite as well because this like, n choose two is quadratic. 
Um, this is the over the square root is going to coordinate itself. So, yes. For for any m, um, making m large is enough. So if we look at these RG flows for a bit, there's one obvious fixed point that we don't need to, don't need to think about very much um, because it's well known that in an individual minimal model, if you add just the one comma three operator, just this finely tuned RG flow, um, this is consistent and it actually leads you to the next minimal model. So there's a, a sort of staircase sequence of integrable RG flows between minimal models that use just this operator and not this one. So if we have a um, flow diagram with G epsilon and G sigma, we can have both of the coupling constants be zero. This gives us just a decoupled case where we have the, the tensor product of minimal models and nothing else. So this is like the three fixed point. And by design, the operators being added to it are relevant, so they make that fixed point unstable. So they give directions that flow away. And we know that this integrable flow that just involves G epsilon would end up somewhere over here. And because this is really a decoupled flow, um, so for each individual, yeah, each minimal model flows by itself, they don't talk to each other. It must be the case that all of the directions here are relevant, making this RG flow attractive. So let's just follow from the topology of one dimension, which is trivial. But there are non trivial solutions like here, uh, the ones we're really interested in. Um, yeah, I should I should probably they are. So let's say n is four, five, or six. There's the, the non-trivial solution for g sigma g epsilon. So there are always two. So you can have Yeah, plus or minus goes in the first slot. The next value of M looks like this. And then because there's this term which only matters for N, um, greater than or equal to six. Um, things start to look a little bit more interesting at m equals six, but it's still easy to solve for what these things are. Here you have six. Yeah, now you have a plus or minus as well in the second slide. So you, you get solutions that look like this. So, we can draw this here. And this diagram strongly suggests that these will have one relevant, or sorry, one irrelevant direction. It looks like this, moving you towards the fixed point, and then one relevant direction moving you away. And this can be explicitly confirmed in conformal perturbation theory by calculating the anomalous dimensions in the infrared, not of sigma and epsilon themselves, but of the linear combinations, the, the mixed operators that become eigenstates of the dilation operator in the infrared. And they exactly tell you that one is weakly relevant, one is weakly irrelevant for this picture. So th this would be one of the fixed points, either um, plus sign or the minus sign, and then you'd have another one down below, 
which for n equals four and n equals five would be exactly the mirror image down below because when we have plus or minus here, for n equals six, you also have something here, so it will be issued in parts. That's the basic picture. Um, yeah, so I haven't said anything about whether these fixed points are rational or irrational and what the chiral symmetry is. So I want to do that now. Um, might have to rush the time a little bit. So the, the key thing here is that these theories have central charge bigger than one. Uh, we have at least four minimal models, so the central charge is at least four. And the RG flows are weakly coupled, so the central charge is going to be a little bit less than four. It's not going to be a little bit greater than four because we see it. But uh, in any case, it's going to be nowhere near one. So because these are CFTs with central charge larger than one, it must be the case that they have infinitely many Virasoro primaries. So the only way for them to be rational, the only way for them to have primary, um, for them to have finitely many primary operators is if these infinitely many Virasoro primaries be combined into, into blocks of some extended cardinal symmetry. So in this case, the two questions, are they irrational and do they have only pure sorrow symmetry are not independent. If we can show that they have only pure sorrow symmetry, then it will immediately follow that they are irrational. So the goal here is to show that they have only a single copy of the pure sorrow algebra. I'm gonna call that your hat, which is generated by the diagonal stress tensor, the sum of the stress tensors from each middle model. We should show that the chiral symmetry in the infrared is no logging. Uh, and of course, this, the chiral symmetry in the UV is much larger. Um, it, chiral symmetry starts off as zero sort of to the n, and we need to show that this all breaks. So the, the most convincing way to show that zero sort of to the n symmetry breaks is to start off by computing anomalous dimensions of the individual stress tensors and showing that they are not zero. So uh, to use conformal perturbation theory to compute an anomalous dimension, the first thing you would want to do is compute a three-point function with one stress tensor, then the sigma operator, and then another stress tensor uh, to, get, to get you the one loop anomalous dimension matrix. Um, but this does happen to be zero, so we need to go to two loops. And in general, to take a general operator and compute its anomalous dimension of two loops, this is a difficult exercise. So the next order here would involve integrating a four-point function. Um, in this case, we would have di sigma sigma dj uh, integrating this four-point function. But because the t's are currents in the uv, which are weakly broken, there's a much easier way to compute this anomalous dimension. We won't We'll be able to get a two loop answer without really doing a full two loop calculation. So, this was discovered in 2015 by Rich Cobb and Tan, and pushed further the next year by Jiombi and Krillin. And the idea is using this conservation equation, um, which only holds at zero coupling. It must mean that in general, the broken conservation equation looks like this. So this means there has to be some operator whose spin is lower by one and whose dimension is greater, greater by one. Um, some operator in the original theory before you perform needs to have the right quantum numbers to be the divergence of the stress tensor. Because the stress tensor is conserved in the UP, so it lives in a short multiplet of conformal symmetry. And things would be very strange if new states just appeared out of nowhere after you added an interaction. What should really happen is that the states reorganize, but you but still have the same um, the same counting. Confused with something simple. So you lose, uh, so you have a bunch of your star symmetries and you lose them by calculation. Describing, how do you know you have any? Um, 
So in this case, we're going to see that the anomalous dimension matrix has an eigenvalue of zero. It's going to be n by n. You're going to have a degenerate n minus one eigenvalues that are not zero. Did you see this explicitly due to the composition? Yes. Yeah, it would, it would be very strange if this were broken as well, because then we would have no stress to sort of generate a novel of the three from local ones. It doesn't just mean you have to have That's possible as well. But yeah, we have this, so we're pretty sure it's a local CFT thing. And up to spin 10, um, I'm going to show that everything. So th this idea of um, one multiple eating another to become one. So when you lose a divergence of the stress tensor, that, that's because some operator, which was originally a primary and, and decoupled theory becomes a descendant of it. This allows you to, to, um, to actually compute anomalous dimensions. So it's a calculation of the power These are papers that explain it very well. And the way it works is you can take this two point function. The conservation equation tells you that we can replace this BGV by the anti holomorphic derivative of the holomorphic with the stress tensor. That's that first order in the coupling. And then you use conformal perturbation for you to write this as an integral. And the integral is the easy, essentially the easiest one to do. It's the integral of a delta function because you're hitting a holomorphic three point function with an anti-holomorphic. So by doing this, you can solve for the value of B explicitly. And now you consider, now that you know B, you consider a two-point function where you use it twice. So this is a two-point function of divergences with the stress tensor. Okay, so And then you can take the universal form of a two-point function of a spin two two-point function, fit it with these derivatives, and you'll get zero if there's no anomalous dimension. Otherwise, it's a big proportional to the anomalous dimension, and you'll get this and solve for the anomalous dimension in terms of this b and the fixed point delta. So that's the strategy you can carry out for these individual stress tensors that generate zeros over to the n in order to check that they break. Yeah, and I won't bore you with the details, but I'll just write down what these operators are. Like, what operator B is the stress tensor going to eat in this particular model? So we have operators that are weakly relevant. So we have sigma, which has an anti-holomorphic dimension of one and a holomorphic dimension of one. So if we add L minus one, if we take a derivative of sigma, which we can do with respect to any of these n here to algebras, but then it'll have the same quantum numbers as the divergence the stress tensor. It'll have holomorphic weight two and holomorphic weight one. So we have the first L minus one hitting sigma all the way up to the nth L minus one hitting sigma. But the key is that this doesn't have n degrees of freedom. It really has n minus one degrees because if we add up all of these operators, this becomes a total derivative acting on sigma, which is a descendant. And we need primaries to use this rule. So we really have n minus one operators that can be eaten. And this um, agrees all with our expectation that n minus one linear combinations of this will lift leaving diagonal one from zero. So 
uh, for calculational reasons, it's just more convenient to work with these stress tensors where the trace is subtracted. So these add to zero. And then you can have these vectors being eaten, which also add to zero. Uh, phi in this case is phi one comma two. I just don't want to write one comma two every time. So I believe it's this. And then you ultimately find that the, the non trivial linear combinations, the dilation eigenstates, which get on those dimensions, are these ones. And the anomalous dimension is the fixed point sigma coupling squared times pi squared times this three over n minus one. So we've computed this explicitly, but we didn't need to compute it explicitly. We really just wanted to show that it was non zero. Uh, because that means that you don't have individual here sorrow symmetries in the infrared at the moment. Um, but we're not done. So what we've done so far is shown that the chiral symmetry is at least as large as the diagonal of your sorrow. And it is strictly smaller than the tensor product of your sorrows. But the diagonal Vera Soro, like individual Vera Soro symmetries, these are not the only sub W algebras of Vera Soro to the end. There could be all sorts of W algebras that live in the middle. And we need to show that those higher spin currents that could potentially generate these break as well. So we've sort of done what we need to do at spin two in some sense, but we need to go to spin four next and then spin six and essentially go as high as we can go as the computers uh, get too higher. So I'll just write a few examples of the operators I'm talking about. So if we have four minimal models, then there's a spin four current, which can be built from normal ordered products of the stress tensors, um, of, the, of the individual stress tensors. And I'll write it this way. So. Uh, and maybe one thing worth noting is that because we know that the Vera Soro hat symmetry is preserved now, because we've shown that this diagonal combination doesn't live, um, in order to see, in order to explicitly check these other higher spin currents built from normal order products, we can restrict our attentions to operators that are primary under Vera Soro hat, because we know that's the symmetry at least. So all of the descendants all the Vera Soro hat descendants are going to lift in the same way as the primaries. They're, they're going to have the same anomalous dimensions. So we can just try to see if anomalous dimensions are non zero for the Vera hat primaries. And we can also make sure, we can also save time by just checking what the anomalous dimensions are for the Vera hat primaries, which are SN singlets. Because if you had um, non trivial representations of the SN symmetry, um, If you had J, which was in a non trivial representation and it happened to be preserved, and you had J again, you could consider this OPD and you find some normal ordered product JJ, which is uh, an SN signal. So if there's some non singlet current which is preserved, then there is also necessarily going to be a singlet which is preserved, but not vice versa. So this explicit check that that we did up to spin 10, it considers the beer hat primaries, which are SN singlets. And the first of these is this one at spin four. So to just say a few words about how we did this check in spin four, um, we looked for the possible Vs that have the right quantum numbers to match the divergence of this. 
and we found a slightly long expression. Might be one of the last things I write. One more turn. So you can act with an L minus three on one of four operators, or you can act with L minus one, the derivative in these different ways of how you distribute the derivatives. Uh, you don't have to act with L minus two because this is actually a null operator in the minimal model. So L minus two acting on it is equivalent to acting with L minus one squared. So you have to be careful with null states to do this. But when we take this T and this V and we compute the anomalous dimension, we find uh, that this anomalous dimension of a spin four current is now seven quarters pi squared times this uh, so that is non-zero as well so this is how we know that at spin four with n equals four uh, the potential higher spin currents are broken as well uh, this continues to be the case with n equals five six and seven and as you increase n there's always uh, there's always a large enough value of n such that this number stabilizes so, so what, what I'm writing here is I'm writing the number of currents in the tensor product of minimal models, and then the number of beads, the, the number of potential food or the pieces of food that they can eat. And it's very good news here that the number of pieces of food is always much larger than the number of potential currents. It, it, it's, it's always larger, it, it quickly becomes much larger. So this, this matrix, which enters in this calculation, you have Ti, Vj, and Sigma. This is always going to have a few rows and it's going to be, and the rows are going to have many columns. So it's going to be much wider than it is tall. So in order to have all of the currents lift, you need the rows to be linearly independent. And since the rows live in a very high dimensional space, it is intuitively expected that they will be linearly independent. So if there's going to be any failure of this, if, if there is going to be a current that actually doesn't break and still has an anomalous dimension of zero like this one did, um, one should expect it to happen at fairly low spin. And we've checked up to spin 10. Um, it takes about one CPU day to generate, um, to check that in all these cases, um, the currents all lift. So that, that's the state of our evidence that these CFTs only have the beer hat symmetry and are therefore irrational. Um, so we expect that everything's going to break as we keep going up in spin, but we don't have a way of proving this yet. And there, yeah, there's some future directions that um, that I guess I'll close with. But um, are, are, are there any questions about, about the main the, the main point I wanted to put from here? Okay, so so one future dimension, one future direction is to figure out what's what's going on here. It's actually when when you have n equals four, with uh, there is one case there is one higher spin current we found so if, if n is at least five then all of these higher spin currents break but when n equals if you look at n equals four and spin six this two by two matrix with two currents and two um yeah two potential divergences of them is actually singular so there is one linear combination of the t's which is unbroken here 
So for a couple of minimal models, this actually does have some extended chiral symmetry. So it has a spin two generator, this, this Pirasora one, but it also has a spin six generator. So its W algebra could be W two comma six, um, which has been studied in the nineties. That there was there was a series of papers trying to classify W algebras back when people had more hope that that was possible. They quickly found that they were just so many W algebras. But there there are some things known about this. In particular, the central charges of their minimal models are known, and they do not accumulate near central charge four, which would be the UV central charge for this. So if it if it does turn out that this n equals four case doesn't have any other higher spin turns, if spin six is the last one, they get a unit's algebra, then it's still going to be irrational. It's just going to be irrational with respect to the enhanced Carl symmetry that it has. So that is something to look into. Um, there is also the opportunity to study flows that don't preserve SN symmetry. So I was summing over all permutations in order to have SN preserved in these interactions, but you can also break that to all sorts of um, all sorts of non-trivial subgroups like we've done for um, for the epsilon expansion awaiting the free theory. And a very interesting choice would be Zn, which describes periodic boundary conditions if you couple a stack of 2D minimal models together. So you can have a minimal model living here, another one living there, and take n to be large to approximate some sort of 3D crystal things. We know 2D crystals um, really are described by minimal models in many cases. Um, and finally, something we're working on right now is coupling minimal models, which are not minimal models of uh, the Virasoro algebra, so not these ones where the central charge goes between one half and one, but minimal models of some W algebra. And then the question is, is this going to break the individual W symmetries to have a single W symmetry in the IR? Is it going to break them even more to have, again, a single Virasoro symmetry in the IR? Um, I think there are a lot of interesting questions there. So I think I'll stop now and thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question is slightly okay, not really a problem. So it's actually really hard to construct the matrix models that describe CFPs that are similar to that greater than one, right? Value. So I was wondering, so you have, so this model, because it's a coupling of several minimal models, I guess you could formulate it for the matrix model. And then you could, you know, take these operators, I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with um, the work you're talking about. So the W is staying here, but now I'm, I'm going to, to be fun. So not, not minimal models in some lab statistics, but the, the dynamic elements, right? So here on the surface, flux rates. Happy to do to do the bottom graph. And then you take a matrix model in the, in the double scaling field that is described this minimal model that describes the minimal model on the level surface. Okay. And I was wondering whether one could construct some similar model in a in a matrix model language. So that in order to go beyond the sequence one value, I don't know what about this. It's slightly off topic. Yeah, well, I, I didn't know that this program uh, became harder when you went above central charge one to begin with. So I, yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Um, when it comes to coupling to gravity, though, I, I can mention that one holographic direction that might be worth looking into is this extension to minimal models of W algebra, um, because there they would have central charge greater than one. Um, there's this correspondence I don't know much about due to Gabardiel and Gopal Kumar, where W minimal models are equal to higher spin gravity theories in ADS3. And because you can consider flows that couple them, um, it, it, it might be worth seeing what, what this corresponds to on the gravity side, like maybe some like, interaction between two asymptotic boundaries. I don't really know. Maybe kind of a, 
a general question, but I guess you can start with these minimal models and imagine populating them and perturbing or having having tensor products and perturbing and uh, flowing and sort of generating some big space of theories. And, uh, I mean, do you have any sense of like how big is that? Could, could you get general conformal field theories that way or? Um, I don't think they'd be very general. Um, in, in particular, there's nothing that's very holographic about these. They, they have weakly relevant operators and, and above them, and, and yeah, and, and above the, uh, the marginal operators would be, um, it, it's not like the irrelevant operators would have a large gap. So I, yeah, I, I think this, this would be a class like some class of irrational CFTs, and there there also be a whole other class that this wouldn't touch. Um, but it, it's at least encouraging that the larger the value of n is, so, so the larger the simple charges that you're considering, the more um, the more CFTs you expect to find, because then you can break SN in in more and more ways. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess an analogy with the the epsilon expansion, with um, starting from the n free scalars. You'd have to be careful that a lot of a lot of the fixed points you find with broken symmetry um, would sort of recycle results at um, at lower values of n. So yeah, you could take some fixed points with n equals four, n equals five, and then just have a tensor product of that fixed point be something at at n equals nine, say a tensor product of two n equals four, n equals five. So the so in, in addition to doing some brute force check of, of the higher spin currents, you would also need some brute force check to make sure you found something genuinely new. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting direction. I also have kind of a naive question that perhaps you already answered. Um, so you started saying that by, by stating a couple of features that you wanted from theory and say that there wasn't any known example and showing us evidence pointing that this is an example. Now that you have this, let's assume that the evidence is, is pointing in the right direction. Is there something that you have in mind that this particular field could be useful for describing like a particular system or some kind of application? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, the um, to, to, to really take advantage of, of the fact or, or the suspicion that this is um, a compact, unitary, irrational CFT with only fear of zero symmetry, um, I would still need to use numerics um, because we don't know for which values of M that this will continue to be a fixed point with these properties. Um, I've been working at asymptotically large M, but there would be some control window of some finite extent that we don't know what the what the critical value of that is. So I think it would be best to start by determining that numerically and then see if we can really um, yeah, re re really find some small enough value of M such that this corresponds to actual um, like a system we're familiar with, like couple and tricritical icing models and couple and tetracritical icing models. And then M, M won't be large anymore. We have to, yeah, after we've determined the special value of M, we have to also use numerics to simulate that model. Um, but we can compare that to, um, to, to the expectations from the analytic bootstrap. So yeah, I, I don't have an immediate application model. So that there's a representation of these minimal models using this coset construction. Ah, yes. Uh, does that, if, if you reformulate everything that you told us in, in that language, can that give you some better handle on what this W symmetry could be? Yeah, that's Since it, it kind of extends, it, it builds in a natural extension to the Virasoro algebra from, from the outset. Yeah, so, so these cosets are essentially um, Ws and W models that give you these, these minimal models. And then 
when you have W minimal models, this um, this can be done in the same way. You don't just have SL2 um, Ws and W models. You have more, more of them. So I, I think that would be a very useful point of view to try to restrict what possible W algebras can live in the middle. Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't know any theorems or, or any, um, or even, even bootstrap conjectures for what the possible, what the possible symmetry breaking patterns are mm -hmm. between here's zero to the n and here's zero hat. Um, there, there might be some result, um, like if someone might be able to make a sharp statement um, that you only have to go to spin 10 or spin 12 or something. And, and at that point, maybe, uh, maybe we won't have to say we just went as high as we could and then, uh, we, and then it became too computationally intensive, maybe there actually will be a finite amount of stuff we have to check. Um, so I, I think the cosine construction would be useful in that. Uh, I definitely agree. But um, yeah, I, I have to talk to some people who really know about that. Yeah, maybe in, in the worst case, it, it just gives you a family of C greater than one theories to rule out. That like it, the, the, this construction cannot lead to one of those theories that has an extended symmetry with C greater than one. Yeah, that's possible. Any more questions? No, let's thank you. Can I erase this? No. You can leave it up. Let me. Uh...